Good evening, everyone. There we go. Oh, start with applause. Thank you so much for being patient with us. Welcome to the State Representative District 3B Candidate Forum this Thursday, June 13th. I'm Kitty Mayo, editor of the Lake County Press. I'm pleased to be here as your moderator for the event, which is sponsored by the Lake County Press, KTWH Two Harbors Community Radio, and Jose Leon Two Harbors Media. In addition to being live streamed on KTWH 99.5 and MMA, I'm gonna have to get back to you on that. We just had to make a, a last minute switch on where we're being live streamed for the video. You will be able to find uh, recordings to listen to and view this event, and you'll be able to find those links on the Lake County Press Facebook page and in next Friday's edition of the Lake County Press. So I'm gonna run through some rules really quick so that everybody's aware of how we're doing this. Uh, Natalie will get the first question. She's going to first be able to introduce herself. We had a little coin toss, you saw I dropped that on the floor. She'll have two minutes to do that. We have a timekeeper in the front row and I'll ask the candidates kind of keep an eye on that what you, when you have your 30 seconds to the end of your time. We'll keep to the time and we'll keep rolling through questions. As soon as Natalie finishes her two minute introduction, then we'll give Mark a two minute introduction and then we'll start with our questions, three minutes for answers and we'll continue through until we hit our time. So at that point, I'm gonna turn this over to Natalie's Lesnikar and say please introduce yourself. Is it working now? All right, perfect. Well, I'm Natalie Zelesnikar, and it's great to be here tonight in community. It's hard to believe that 30 years ago, I started as a nursing home administrator just down the road at Sunrise Nursing Home, which is now Waterview. And that was a great experience, and I was able to work in community with Dr. McMahon and Dr. Josephs to, and with the commissioners to figure out an aging plan for housing, and it led to the first assisted living on a campus, one of the first in Minnesota, and it's still there today, hooked onto the nursing home uh, just down the road to provide housing for seniors for generations to come. My leadership continued in healthcare, and my goal was to create a great place to live and a great place to work and a great place to visit. And the values that have shaped me to do that are really the values I learned growing up on the farm in, uh, my ho at my family farm and uh, just learning how to be, work hard and be kind and to try to serve people. And I've done that my entire life and I continue to do that working in public service right now. I have been married for 32 years. My husband Dan is here tonight. We have two sons that are grown. We have a daughter-in-law that all went to public school at Hermantown. And we will soon be grandparents in November. We have our first grandchild due on election night. So. <laughs> Perfect timing. And I am very proud that I was able to go to St. Paul, be in the minority party, and still get things done. I worked on four workforce bills. I'm on the workforce committee. I worked hard to get it done. And I got the EMT program, and I got uh, a support service so that regardless if you're in a nursing home, assisted living, you'll never be alone on your last days because that went on during the COVID pandemic and we have 40% increase in mental health. So our health includes our mental health, we're better together. And so I have been working hard to get that done and those bills all passed. We have trades in our schools now. The grants went through for that for workforce. So we'll be bringing pathways for trades as well as a four-year degree. So I'm excited to serve you and look forward to being your state representative. Thank you. Thank you, Natalie. Mark? Well, thank, you. thank you all for being here. Uh, try the button. Again. There you go. He, it's the opposite of what he told us. <laughs> anyway, thank you for all, all the guests for uh, being here to listen to our discussion tonight about the issues that are important to Northeastern Minnesota. Um, thank you, Kitty, for being the moderator, to Kim, Jose, and the media folks that are here. Uh, this is the best part of democracy, is talking about issues, meeting face-to-face, -face, coming to uh, you know, a discussion about what is important to us. Um, my campaign started with a slogan of integrity, passion, and purpose. For 14 years, I was a city attorney for the city of Proctor. For 18 years, I was in private practice. I was a prosecutor. I uh, was then a judge for 23 years. Uh, 20 as a full-time judge, 
three years as a senior judge during COVID where we did everything by Zoom, which is a terrible way to run a justice system. Uh, I spent uh, five years as the backup judge to Judge Sandvik and Judge Cuso here on the North Shore in Lake County and Cook County. I spent a lot of time in this uh, neck of the woods, so to speak. So that's a little bit about my background. I'm retired, so people ask me, why in the world would you do this? And I'll tell you why. For our grandchildren, very simply. I believe in the old Native American seven generations forward, and that's why I'm here. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> All right, we're gonna move on to our first question for Natalie. And I'm purposely starting with this. I think it's one that everyone wants to know. Natalie, what would you do to move closer to constructively disagreeing with the other party in the House, and even though you may not support the preferred policies, still manage to get work done for the district you represent and build trust within and of our governing bodies? Thank you for the question. That's what I've been doing in the minority party for the last two years, is working across the aisle I did that in community. I never knew who a Democrat, Independent, or Republican was my entire life. And my goal was to work for the people, for a common goal. The majority of people are in the middle. And working across the aisle wasn't easy in one party rule. But I still got things done. I got four bills passed. I was actually one of the only Republicans that was selected on the conference committee to help get resolution so we could pass a bill, because it has to go through the Senate and the House before it can come to the final vote. And we got agreement, it took five meetings. Many of the conference committees didn't meet. They just refused to meet because people wouldn't get along. They didn't get along in the same party, let alone with the other side. And so the goal is to get things done for the people. I work for you and I have to work with all people like I've done my entire life. And so I think that's the principle that you have to do. I answer emails from everyone. I have people in my office from all sides, and I listen to everybody. I have an open door policy, I haven't said no to anybody, and I welcome them in my office at the Capitol, and I think we've learned from each other, and that's, that's been the style I've done my entire life in community, and that's the style that I will continue to do. I was able to get things done under one party rule this last session, so thank you for the question. Thank you, Natalie. Mark, I'm gonna reread the question. What can you do to move closer to constructively disagreeing with the other party in the House, and even though you may not support their preferred policies, still manage to get work done for the district you represent and build trust within and, within and of our governing bodies? My old, my old man told me once that all you have in this life is your word. Your word is your bond. Um, so it starts there. It starts with interpersonal relationships and it starts with honesty and integrity. Um, I listen to the representative's remarks and I come to the conclusion that it doesn't make a lot of sense to me that she's claiming that she reaches across the aisle. I'm sorry to say that to you here today, but she does not. I'll give you a couple of examples that are right here in Lake County. Number one, in 2023, there was an $11 million allocation in the transportation bill for Highway 61. That was the priority project for this county and the people of Two Harbors and the North Shore. She voted against that, all right? She now writes in the local newspapers that she supported it. That's not integrity. Number two, there was a $8 million allocation within the tax bill in 2023 for these schools, Lake Superior School System. She voted against it. It got passed, both those got passed, why? Because you have a Democratic senator who can work with other people. He can't work with the current representative and she doesn't wanna work with the current, represent the current senator. That makes it impossible to bring home those projects that this community wants, needs, and deserves. So, how am I gonna change that? All of my life, I've worked with other people in the court system. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter where you come from. 
I treated everyone that came before me the exact same way. And I'll listen to you, the stories from whomever it is. And I'll listen to the facts and the evidence, because that's what judges do. And that's what legislators sh should do as well. Stick to the facts and the evidence and what's in front of you and not go off on philosophical journeys. And I will not do that. Thank you, Mark. Natalie. Natalie, we're going to give you the 30 seconds for rebuttal. Go ahead. Well, the inexperience shows here because the reality is, is I did, I was an author. I was an author for the $11 million uh, gap funding, and I did work with Senator Hochschild on that. But the majority party had a decision at the 11th hour of where they were going to move it. So they took it out of bonding, which we would have, I voted for bonding, and they moved it into transportation. And when they did that, the overall transportation and crewed a train to Duluth for 194 million. And it was stacked up with many things that was taking away money from the people in the community, and so ultimately I had to say no. And $11 million, $8 million tax bill, they spent all of it. So Natalie, we're in that's deficit. your 30 seconds. Thank you. Thank you. This next question, we'll start with you, Natalie. In these past two sessions, legislators spent the $18 billion surplus, raised $10 billion in new taxes, raised fees on many state services, added a tax on home deliveries, prioritized a tax credit on new electric bike purchases, and enacted a paid leave program that's already 25% over budget and not up and running. How would you ensure controls on spending and taxation if you were elected? This is a question for Minnesota. How much do you want your taxes to go up? You cannot keep spending and being everything you want, you cannot get. And they spent $17.5 billion of a historic surplus in five months. They upped the ante. It's not gambling with your everyday money. And that's what they did. The delivery fee is going to hurt the poorest of Minnesotans who can't get out, who don't drive. Every time an Amazon box shows up, you're going to be paying for it. And so we gave tax credits on EV vehicles to people who make $300,000. They don't need it. We increased an inflationary gas tax on people that drive used cars and everything else. They got no breaks. The average working family is seeing increases from these type of reckless spending. We need reasonableness. That is not, that, that is ruling in one party rule, we spent all the money and we're gonna go into a deficit. And so it's easy to spend other people's money, but it's a lot harder to make decisions when there isn't money. And so I'm gonna be at the table when we had money, and I hope to be at the table when we don't have money because you need leaders that can make tough decisions. Thank you. Thanks, Natalie. Mm. I'll read that again for you, Mark. In these past two sessions, legislators spent the $18 billion surplus raised $10 billion in new taxes, raised fees on many state services, added a tax on home deliveries, prioritized a tax credit on new electric bike purchases, enacted a paid leave program that's already 25% over budget and not up and running. How would you ensure controls on spending and taxation if you were elected? So first, I come from the place that I'm a retiree. I'm on a fixed income. Now granted, I'm on a fixed income that includes a very generous pension from the state of Minnesota. So I'm a different situation than say someone who is simply on Social Security, right? But I get that I don't want to tax folks out of their home. Um, I am not a tax and spend liberal, despite what people think, that's not who I am. In fact, with respect to my campaign, I have my campaign manager is a former a Republican business owner. He's now in my corner because he doesn't like what he sees out there in terms of the other side of the aisle. That's not the party that he signed up to be part of. My treasurer is a C, uh, CPA, former uh, CFO of a company, a uh, local company. Uh, those two guys ground me in terms of taxing and spending. Trust me, they talk to me about it all the time. One thing that Minnesota has, and all the other 50 states have, is we can't deficit spend. So what's interesting to me is that last year, when there was a surplus, and it got spent down for whatever projects got spent down on, including uh, paid home, le paid leave, and et cetera, 
The other side of the aisle screamed that there is going to be hell to pay this year. Why? Because you're going to be in a deficit situation. You're going to have to raise taxes to cover the deficit. Guess what? We had a surplus again. Now, there can be arguments made about you're being taxed too much, et cetera, et cetera. But the truth of the matter is the other side claimed that there was going to be an economic downturn. There was going to be a deficit that was going to cause us problems, and that did not happen. We ended up with a surplus again this year. How you spend that surplus? That's why I want to go to St. Paul. Am I going to make the same decisions that the so-called trifecta does? Absolutely not. I'm my own person. That's what I've done for you know f almost 40 some years in the law. I make decisions, and I don't have other people make decisions for me. Thank you, Mark. <laughs> Mark, you'll get this question first. What is your opinion of the last minute 1,400 page omnibus bill being brought to the legislature in the last 20 minutes of last session? You know, my party might get mad at me, but I don't like doing business that way, right? I want to see and understand what's in front of me before I make decisions. And so I wouldn't be uh, particularly happy having that happen to me as a legislator. And I don't think Representatives Lozakar should be happy that that happens to the legislature either. It would not be something that I would want to have happen because like I said, I make decisions based upon what's in front of me. You can't read 1,400 pages in a day, two days, three days, whatever period. Sure, you can have aides you know, come and tell you what it says, but that's not reading the bill. You know, and I did read some of the bills that had to do with other topics. I obviously did not go through, through 1,400 pages, and I don't think any legislator should, period. Thank you, Mark. Natalie, same question for you. What is your opinion of the last minute 1,400 page omnibus bill being brought to the legislature in the last 20 minutes of last session? The bottom line is that she, yes, it's the other way. The bottom line is that's not how government should work, whether it's Democrat in control or uh, re Republicans in control. And I've said that all along. I mean, it looked like something like you'd seen a third world country where it's just gavel, 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 gavel. And the reality is, is that we've had one party rule for two years. And this could have been done different, but we had five days where the Senate didn't meet when the senator was uh, charged with burglary for a felony in Detroit Lakes. We had 11 hours where the other senator refused to come into session because of the Uber Lyft until they settled that. They weren't going to come work with the Senate. So the Senate was behind. The reality is the House and the Senate have to agree to get things done. The Senate didn't do their job. And then the tax uh, bill, whose Senator Hostchild is on that committee, they didn't even meet. They met two times out of, I think, six, seven meetings. I met every night on the omnibus bill I was on for the conference committee. You cannot not meet. And the Democrats didn't agree between the, the senator and, and the House and the Senate didn't agree at the Democrat level. And so they, they were just not meeting and they went to the 11th hour and they rolled 10 bills in, in this 1,100 or 1,400 page bill. So no, it shouldn't happen again. And I think that's clear to Minnesotans. Thank you, Natalie. <laughs> Natalie, you'll go first with this next one. And I think you'll be glad to have the time. <laughs> Last year, listening sessions with state legislators were held in two harbors where a wide variety of people, constituents, and local businesses owners mm -hmm. said that the number one priority was securing funding to fill the $11 million gap to complete the Highway 61 mm -hmm. reconstruction project in our community. In the end, Republicans voted against this legislation citing concerns about the total cost of this transportation funding bill and objections to some of the other projects funded by it. To what extent do you feel it's your responsibility to support, with your vote, legislation that would help your constituents even if it goes against your party's wishes? Thanks for the question. And the reality is I voted and I was an author on the bill for the $11 million transportation. The party that's in control has the authority of where they're going to move bills around. And that's what happened at the 11th hour, and that's why I let people know in the paper, because that is the truth. So 
Uh, Democrats do that and Republicans do that. So that's how it works in politics. And so I can't fault him for not understanding that, but that's how it is down at the Capitol. And so the parties move it around and that's what they did. And so ultimately I had to decide with transportation bill, bonding typically is not in there. We had a bonding, we had everything else in bonding, but that got moved out. I fully supported it. Everybody in Two Harbors knew I did. And I let them know exactly what I've said to you, is that the reality was there was a lot of other things that were gonna increase the liability for Minnesota taxpayers when we have a boondoggle going on with Southwest Light Rail. We're behind the target. We have people not riding. We have a whole issue. So I wanted the money going for lanes and not trains. We have an issue with our potholes, our roads, our bridges, that should be the priority. Not 194 million for just one train when we haven't fixed the other issues in Minneapolis, St. Paul, and add more trains to Duluth and more trains from Chicago to Minneapolis. That's not what anybody emailed me saying it was a priority. So I had to deal with the poison pill that they put that in there and say, no, I gotta look out for all of Minnesota and the people I represent in Northeastern Minnesota. The Democrats had the responsibility of where they were putting it. They knew I supported the $11 million uh, gap money and that should have happened and it, and it did happen because we had a $17.5 billion surplus. So of course they were gonna get the $11 million funding for a major thoroughfare that we all use where we live, work and visit in the state and they knew I supported it. They chose to put it in something that ended up being a poison pill because trains are not real popular for a lot of people in the district and a lot of people even in Minneapolis, St. Paul because we haven't fixed the issues we have and to add millions more of liability to Minnesotans was problematic. Thank you. Thank you, Madeline. <laughs> Mark, I'm not gonna read the whole question again. You're pretty familiar with it. Could you answer the part to what extent do you feel it's your responsibility to support with your vote legislation that would help your constituents even if it goes against your party's wishes? I am running for district house seat here in northeastern Minnesota. I am not running for a house seat across the state of Minnesota. My constituents are the 13 townships, the four cities, um, and some of the unincorporated uh, rural areas, not the rest of the state of Minnesota. When an entity like Lake County says, this is our number one priority, and we do not want downtown Two Harbors closed down for three years because the $11 million isn't there, that's something your representative needs to listen to. It's pretty simple. So with respect to the issue, I think she's way on the wrong side of the issue. She put personal principle over the constituents of this district. Thank you, Mark. And Natalie, you'll get... <laughs> Natalie, 30 minutes for rebuttal. 30 seconds, rather, for rebuttal. <laughs> I'm glad he thinks I have personal discipline, because I do, to look out for your taxes, to look out for how much more you're gonna be on the hook for another train boondoggle that is not going to benefit you. And, and you're gonna be on the hook for taxes on these trains that are not, uh, where we don't have uh, efficiency and accountability. We just saw more fraud today from the state of Minnesota. It's a theme. The Office of Legislative Auditors have had theme after theme Thank after you, theme on the light rails. Thank you. For those of you in the audience, all of these questions were unseen by the candidates ahead of time. However, we did send them out three questions that were fairly complex, and we're gonna roll into those right now. I'm gonna start with, I'm gonna start with Mark first. And we're gonna go through the three questions that are related. So the first part will go to Mark, and then Natalie, and then second part, et cetera. We'll keep doing it like that. All right, Mark, do you support following up on the bill passed in the Minnesota House on May 19, 2024, giving the people of Minnesota the opportunity to cast a binding vote on changing the Minnesota Constitution to provide protection under an equal rights amendment? 
Yes. The short answer is yes. The long answer is I don't understand why the party that claims to be for individual personal rights has a problem with the people of the state of Minnesota voting on a constitutional amendment. The legislature is not dictating that this will be the law of the state of Minnesota. The bill simply asks, should this be put to the people of the state of Minnesota? And I'll tell you what, I think the real reason that they're afraid of this bill, that they're afraid of letting the people vote, is Kansas. Why do I say that? In the state of Kansas, the people voted as to whether or not abortion should be legal or not. This is a state that Donald Trump won by 10 points. It's a red state. The people of the state of Kansas followed what every single poll in the United States has shown for the last 30 years. They want abortions to be safe, infrequent, and legal. That's only part of the ERA, but they're so afraid of it, they won't let you vote. Thank you, Mark. Natalie, do you support following up on the bill passed in the Minnesota House on May 19, 2024, giving the people of Minnesota the opportunity to cast a binding vote on changing the Minnesota Constitution to provide protection under an Equal Rights Amendment? The short answer is yes. The real question is which ERA bill? The ERA of the 70s when it was based on sex, which was clearly defined, or is it the ERA bill that they drafted three weeks before and changed the language with an expanse of definitions to be national origin and race, but they left out religion, they left out age. So which ERA bill are we talking about? And then are the questions going to be clear to the public so that the public understands if this means that biological boys can be in girls' locker rooms? Does this mean that we're going to lose the opportunity to have Title IX after only 50 years of having it? When my grandmother wanted to play basketball and finally could, people need to know what they're voting for. I am 100% for something on the ballot. I want them to know what they're voting for. Which ERA bill? Thank you, Natalie. Mark, you can expand on what you've already said. The second part of this is, why do you support or oppose such an amendment? Why do you support this amendment? Well, there's one thing that she just said that is actually true. The beginning bill that was introduced early on was far more expansive than the last uh, language that went to the House and um, did not get adopted by the Senate. Um, and there are two parts to this. There's the part I just talked about, reproductive rights and reproductive freedom. Then there is the issue of equal rights in the employment, equal rights in the workplace, equal rights in society. 100% I am for establishing in our Constitution, if it takes that, the rights of women to be equal to men in every facet. Uh, the rest of the issues, gender, et cetera, I might agree that perhaps we need to look at exactly what the language is that we're going to put in front of the people, but ultimately, I want the people to be able to decide these issues, and that is not what the Republicans want to have happen, despite what my opponent says. Natalie, why do you support or oppose such an amendment? I think we all want equal rights. Oh, I guess I gotta turn myself on. Thank you for the question. I think equal rights is something we all want. I mean, we have a 14th Amendment for it. I mean, I have the Constitution right here. And so I think the issue right now that's before us is making sure there's clarity on what people are voting on. It's not if we should put it to a vote. I don't have any problem putting it to a vote. What I have a problem with is people asking me, what am I voting on? Am I voting on the 1971, where it was simply the right to have equal rights based on sex when we all agreed on how to define that, or is it different? And it's clearly different. It's this much different in wording. And so the people need to know that that is different, and they're changed the rules of the words. And so when that's clear to people, then I think that's great. Let them have the information to vote. Thank you, Natalie. 
I think the next part of the question gets a little bit closer to, you know, if you were doing the language writing of the bill, what would you put in it? If you support an amendment vote by the people, what equal rights protections would you want to see included in the amendment to be put in a statewide vote within two years? Mark. I'm going to grab the actual language that went from the House to the Senate that did not pass because I, I don't see a problem with the actual language. And the representative is conflating two things. She's conflating the 1972 federal ERA language with the present Minnesota experience. And those are two very different things. Um, actually, the federal uh, ERA passed uh, with the vote of Virginia just recently, but it's still sitting out there because there's an argument about whether or not it's timely given how long it's taken. So here was the ballot question that actually went to um, the, from the House to the Senate. Shall the Minnesota Constitution be amended to say that all persons shall be guaranteed equal rights under the laws of this state and shall not be discriminated against on account of race, color, national origin, ancestry, disability or sex, including pregnancy, gender, and sexual orientation. That language should be put to the state residents, the state voters of this state, and I have no problem with it whatsoever. Thank you, Mark. For you, Natalie, I'll read it again. If you support an amendment vote by the people with equal rights protections, would you want to see, what would you want to see included in the amendment to be put in a statewide vote within two years? I think it comes down to what the people want. Do they want the definition that was set up by the federal government when states were ratifying this that is clear, simple definition based on sex? If we can't define that, then, then that's a second question. My opponent has contradicted himself because he said he had some issues with the language that says a biological male could be in a female locker room. This language that came in front of the house does not allow safe spaces. I wrote a bill for that to allow safe spaces for women in domestic abuse shelters, in rape centers, and prisons, and locker rooms. I'm concerned about our young girls. I'm also concerned about Title IX, and this bill will strip the rights of Title IX for girls' sports, without a doubt. And so, yes, I would love to see a bill that is based on sex, that is just where we define it as a biological male and a biological female, and have the definition be able to do, or bring it to the vote of the people, where clearly we have to have conversations to solve some of these issues so that we know what we're voting on. Thank you, Natalie. <laughs> I'm gonna give it back to you for 30 seconds. Mark, you get a rebuttal for 30 seconds if you'd like. Again, my opponent conflates the 1972 federal ERA uh, constitutional amendment, which Minnesota has already ratified. We were one of the states that ratified it. This has nothing to do with that. This has to do with the language that I read to you. And I think the state of Minnesota is smart enough, learned enough, and well-grounded enough to read that, understand what it is, and take a vote on it. It's very simple. Thank you, Mark. <laughs> Natalie, do you want 30 seconds? The reality of this language that's in here, all matters. You cited on the abortion topic with Kansas that Minnesota, that Kansas wanted safe, infrequent, and legal. I would like that too. This, the way this is written, the way Minnesota is right now, it's up to 40 weeks. We went beyond Roe versus Wade. I offered amendments to, to have Roe versus Wade in Minnesota, which was viability. The Democrats went to match what North Korea and China does, 40 weeks. So we have to define these things of what Minnesotans want. Thank you. Thank you, Natalie. All right. That was your hard questions for the night. Now it's just downhill, super easy. Thanks you guys for giving time for those. The next question is about schools and I'm gonna to go to Natalie first. With rural schools, including Lake Superior School District, number 381, struggling mightily with funding and having to lay off teachers and reduce programs, what will you do to help bring more money into our school district or otherwise support our schools? Natalie, go ahead. The reality is the Republicans offered a higher formula than the Democrats wanted. They chose the 4 and 2%, which meant this district got less than a million dollars 
it would have had a million dollars more if they took the funding formula that the, Rep the Republicans proposed. And it had no mandates. And we straddled the districts with mandates. And we said we were going to have historic funding. And, and teachers did get raises, but we have district cuts coming across every district, including this one. They already cut in 2024, and there will be more to come. Because the thing that did not happen is they did not fund the unemployment. We gave unemployment to the bus drivers, the paras, and they had a one-time fund. And when that money's gone, it's coming back to you. Because there is no funding for this. And when you keep making mandates for education without fully funding it, we're going to have to go back to the taxpayers. And that's what's going to happen with this bill. And we're seeing historic layoffs go on and budget cuts. And class sizes are going to go up, and they are. And so when we had a historic investment and a $17.5 billion surplus, it's extremely disappointing to see public education. I wrote a bill also to have teachers be able to retire at 62 and after 30 years of service. That wasn't a priority. We had all this money, and if they wanted to do it, they got everything else done they wanted to do. It was not a priority. They funded the Minnesota Department of Education by 23% increase. No district got that. They grew government instead of growing the classrooms. It's time to fund the classrooms. Thank you, Natalie. Mark, with rural schools, including Lake Superior School District number 381, struggling mightily with funding and having to lay off teachers and reduce programs, what will you do to help bring more money into our school district or otherwise support our schools? Well, number one, when there is a $8 million amount dedicated to the Lake Superior School District, I will vote as your representative to approve that. My opponent voted against it. Again, on principle, that there was going to be an increase in tax, at least in her view of the world. So number one, when school districts tell me what they need and I look at the budget and it's affordable, I'm going to be there to make sure it happens. That's, that's listening to your constituents rather than listening to some principle, some uh, amorphous idea in your head about taxation. I don't want to tax people out of their homes. I want folks that are retired to be able to keep their homes, live in their homes. And part of the problem is we uh, put a lot of our tax base, our monies for schools based upon property taxes. And that's something that Minnesota, back in the Minnesota Miracle Days, under Wendy Anderson in the 1970s, we were the leader in the state. After years of Republicans like Tim Pawlenty, that Minnesota Miracle went away. That funding from the state to help rural areas in their schools, to fund their teachers, to fund the programming that you deserve and you need for your children and your grandchildren, that has been eroded over the years. And now we're trying to recoup it and come back. And so I'm going to do everything I can when uh, the Lake Superior School District, the Proctor School District, the Hermantown School District, when they come to me with an ask, I'm going to look at it and I'm going to try to do the best I can to bring it home for them. Thank you, Mark. All right. You guys are doing great. And I'm going to start with Mark this time. How can we help ensure rural communities have affordable, reliable, nearby medical services from EMT to clinics to hospitals and specialists to keep our communities viable places for people of all ages to live? I've lived for 40 years in Friedenburg Township. Um, I am serviced by a volunteer fire department and EMTs. I understand the sacrifices that those folks make um, and that it's really, really tough to find younger folks to fill uh, those roles. It, it's very difficult. Uh, part of it is um, making sure that they have an adequate pension for their service. Part of it is ensuring that they get the training and equipment they need. Um, and with respect to the health care in the rural areas, I think we've done a uh, disservice to small hospitals, for example, it's not uh, uh, a secret that our rural hospitals are struggling to make 
uh, ends meet and our EMT services. And I agree with uh, Representative Zaleznikar, putting more money to the EMTs is a, is a great thing. We need to do it. We have to fund it. Um, and so I would work hard to do those things. One of my campaign committee people is the former fire chief for the city of Proctor. He's a volunteer. He worked there for 25 years. I listen to folks like that. I'm an evidence-based person, and suggestions from those kinds of people, including local chiefs of police, firefighters, EMTs, healthcare providers, that's how you make reasonable decisions. And let's not forget, politics is always the art of compromise. And that's not something that the other side of the aisle really wants to do. Thank you, Mark. Hmm. Natalie, how can we help ensure rural communities have affordable, reliable, nearby medical services from EMT to clinics to hospitals and specialists to keep our communities viable places for people of all ages to live? Right there, it's on. Okay, thank you for the question. I was elected to be and selected to be on the aging task force by the governor and also on the emergency medical service, the EMS task force. I traveled the state to see what's happening. And we have an ambulance issue. We've had one since 2002. The Office of Legislative Auditors did a report saying rural ambulance, Greater Minnesota, is in a crisis. It sat on a shelf. And so when we had $17.5 billion, it wasn't a priority. The Democrats did not have this be a priority. It wasn't a shocker that it was a problem. It's been a problem documented since 2002. A task force was created after the $17.5 billion was spent, which was interesting to me. So the money's gone. And so now we got, this year we got 24 million to spread around greater Minnesota and six million for a sprint model to have a roaming ambulance so you're available in an area. So we got something, but the reality is they knew ambulances were in an issue. I wrote bills to give volunteer uh, actually things to help with their pension, to give them incentives, and nothing was taken. So in a bipartisan way, there were bills to pass. I had people at PQAM say, hey, why don't, why don't we just get free driver's license and tabs? We have to come in with fire and, and driver's uh, vehicle uh, plates that say fire so that they know. Wouldn't hear the bill. They wouldn't hear the bill to help the people who are volunteering. It was no. And so, I tried to be bipartisan and help that, and I actually have been on committees. So I think it demonstrates that I do work across the aisle, or I wouldn't have been selected to be on those committees. And it's important to know that 70% of our ambulance runs are non-emergency transportation. I helped get half a million dollars for the AOA to work on non-emergency transportation and to serve seniors. Because if the plan is to stay home, but we have no non-emergency transportation, and we're hurting for that, we have to fix that so that people can get to where they need to be. So 100% agree. I got the EMT bill for 100,000 to this school. Lake County Ambulance will be the lead and they will be able to train EMTs in 11th and 12th grade like I got my CNA class in high school. They got rid of health occupations. I'm bringing those things back with the trades. Kids are gonna be able to graduate without having to pay for it and Thank be you, an Natalie. EMT. Thank you. Okay, the next question I'll give to Natalie first. Small Minnesota towns seem to be facing shortages of affordable housing options for folks who seek to live and work here. If the private sector doesn't close that gap, what do you see as the role of state and local governments to help address those needs in a timely way? That's a great question. And housing is an important thing. I've been working on the housing piece because we have not added very many houses to the Two Harbors Market, Proctor, Hermantown, single family homes, duplexes, whatever you call home. And so the data shows that we have not added very many since after 2010, that's a long time ago, of new housing construction. And so we allocated millions for homeless 
uh, shelters, which was great, and to the food shelves, which was great. And so I would like to see more done to have housing built in our communities, and we've been working with that. The biggest thing that I'm hearing back from contractors is, is permitting, and the time it takes to actually get something done at the state and, and to have the, the processes move smoothly, you have to have utilities. One of the bills that I authored uh, last year was for Rice Lake Township to get utilities expansions. And so getting the expansions, you have to have the utilities and all the things set up in order to support the housing plan for the street, strategic plan for the cities. But housing for the working families and for people who are retiring for all through life are critical. Enough rentals, enough housing, and right now we are way behind the eight ball. And so we're on a catch-up plan, and I've been 100% in support of that to get housing for people. Thank you. Thank you, Natalie. Mark? Small Minnesota towns seem to be facing shortages of affordable housing options for folks who seek to live and work here. If the private sector does not close that gap, what do you see as the role of state and local governments to help address those needs in a timely way? So it's not just small communities like Two Harbors and Proctor and Hermantown, it's everywhere. Um, the city of Duluth is facing a housing crisis and has been for the last couple of decades. The problem is the market forces out there uh, are making it virtually impossible for you to build and construct a small home for a starter family type situation. Um, and so the question really is, what is the role of state government maybe partnering with the uh, federal government, the HRAs, the local housing uh, authorities. What is the role in terms of providing subsidies and helping get the housing shortage taken care of? I think there's a role for the state of Minnesota. How much money that is, where it's allocated, I think those are all questions and issues that you debate in a legislative session. But I think that there is no question, you know, housing is one of our fundamental rights. It's one of our fundamental needs. It's one of the things we all have to have. I've got a son that lives in my, my house. Uh, he's working full time. He can't afford rent in the city of Duluth. There's no place for him to find rent and he's working full time. Uh, and he's working a good job. He's not working, you know, at McDonald's or whatever, not to say that it's nothing, there's nothing wrong with that, but in terms of his wage, his wage is a far cry from McDonald's. He still can't afford it, right? When rents are 1,000 to 2,000, you can imagine what your mortgage payment is gonna be if you're building a starter home. So I think there's a role for the state of Minnesota, and I think I would look very long and hard at what those subsidies would look like, how they would be uh, allocated, and what locations, including rural Minnesota, they should go to. Thank you, Mark. <laughs> this will be for you, Mark, and we're gonna stick to a housing-related topic again. I think discussing the government's role in housing is a very interesting one, and there's a lot of pieces to it. So. One voter sent in this question, a huge concern for District 3B affordable housing all throughout the district, as you pointed out. Tourism is often promoted as being really important for our area, mm -hmm. but the increase in second homes and vacation properties have contributed to a shortage of housing stock and driven up property prices across the region. How do you plan to support the tourism industry while also protecting residents from losing access to affordable housing? Well, the vacation rental phenomenon, that's, you know, within the last 20 years, that's become a huge uh, uh, issue with respect to housing. I, n I don't know about Two Harbors specifically, but I know it's up and down the shore. I was ac actually at a... Um, county board meeting where they were talking about it up in the Finland area and the difficulties with respect to these homes that are purchased by outside entities that now are turned into rentals. Uh, and so they're no longer available for local residents to buy or even rent. Um, and so you, that's a good question because you're balancing that with you want to draw people here. You know, I've always looked at Two Harbors as kind of this gem. That's an unexplored, un, and I don't want you know this to turn into Minneapolis North. That's not what I'm saying. But I think your waterfront is something that is a gem that just has never been utilized to its full extent. And so you want to bring tourists to that gem, but you also want to have people living here, uh, raising kids, going to school, 
working at uh, the LP plant or whatever. And so there's a, there's a balance that has to be brought there between, and a lot of it has to do with local zoning, right? It's not so much the state's role, but it's the local zoning officials. And what does the city council of Two Harbors or the uh, county board of Lake County, what or Hermantown or St. Louis County or the city council in Proctor, Rice Lake, what do they allow? You know, what are the, what's the permitting pro process for allowing a vacation rental? Uh, we just saw, everybody read the paper, everybody saw what happened on Park Point with the Cargill family. And that's just the tip of the iceberg. So it's a big problem. It's an issue I'm willing to wade into. But again, there's a lot of local control and zoning. And uh, so that's got to be part of the part and parcel of the, of the puzzle we, we work through. Thank you, Mark. Same question for you, Natalie. A huge concern for District 3B is affordable housing. We know that tourism is important for supporting the economic economics of the district, but the increase in second homes and vacation properties have contributed to a shortage of housing stock and driven up property prices across the board. How do you plan to support the tourism industry while also protecting residents from losing access to affordable housing? Supporting Housing, I think, is important to everybody, and I think local jurisdiction control is what is happening in Minnesota in our communities, and that's the role of the city council and the St. Louis County or Lake County uh, boards to determine for tourism what percentage they want to have, whether it's eight at, for Airbnbs or the VRBO model, how much rentals property they're going to have, and then how many single-family homes are they going to have, whether it's duplexes, senior things, assisted living, that happens at the local level. And I, I support that. I think that's what needs to be because then you have a local strategic plan happening. The city and the county and the chamber know what the strategic plan is, then together to collectively work with utilities and figuring out where the best land is and how to repurpose. And, and, and I helped write and, and author a bill to on the waterfront for uh, Two Harbors to get that land transfer to happen so that Two Harbors can choose to do with the city council what they elect to do, what the people of Two Harbors want, beyond tourism, to live here and work here. I mean, since 2010, this district in 3B has only had 1,478 new homes. That's it. It's not a lot. It goes from Two Harbors, Rice Lake, Proctor, all of the towns in, in 14 townships. So we have an issue of having affordability. And that's what I'm concerned about is affordability. We have, it's, it's the interest rates that this country's gonna have. If you had a 3% mortgage or you have an 8% mortgage, you can do the math. People are stuck. I have seniors calling me saying I can't move because my house is paid for, but I can't move to a different one because my mortgage is gonna be this. And, and new, new families starting out, they might have a mortgage, they got it 3% when it was that. They, they're stuck in their house. They want to move, but they can't move because the mortgage is now not that. And so all these things are affecting the housing market, and I think we have a lot of opportunity, but local control, I think, is critical for strategic planning for housing, for infrastructure, for the schools, to look at the, the mix that balances tourism, but also balances building great communities. Thank you, Natalie. Are we warmed up yet? I said, are we warmed up yet? Yeah, yeah, right? yeah. Okay, good, because you know we're gonna talk about mining, right? <laughs> Natalie, you get this one next. Minnesota is, one of, is said to be one of the places best prepared to mine in an environmentally sound manner. We have witnessed a number of proposals to roll back standards on sulfate, wild rice protection, water quality standards, wetland protection, and continuing efforts to reduce the rigor of permitting and curtail citizens' options to, the, to appeal mining permits in the court system. How do you see the choices we face in protecting the environment while creating economic development specifically to sulfide or copper nickel mine development? Thank you. Thank you for the question. And to me, it's a very simple question. We live in northeastern Minnesota, and we are moving to a clean energy model that involves the critical minerals we have in the ground right in our backyard we, where we live. It makes no sense to me why we would not get those materials here with high paid union jobs when we have the highest standards for everything we do. 
we don't believe in slavery, we don't believe in child labor, but we're going to export these to other countries that do, and then get them back here so that we can create solar panels and, and wind turbines. It makes no sense to me. Why would we not want to trust Minnesotans, the very people that got us through World War II, and we have clean air. I've lived here my whole life. We have clean hair, clean water. We can do it. If anybody's going to do it, Minnesotans are going to do it better than anybody. We have a lot of regulations, and we have the resources here to do what we need to do to move Minnesota forward and to have jobs. And when you have great jobs, we don't have to depend 100% on just tourism. We're going to have the ability to have single family homes and a tax base to have great schools. The reality is, without a strong commercial tax base, the strong commercial tax base relieves the burden from you as an individual taxpayer. The strong commercial tax base through mining and through other types of uh, industry allows us to have strong schools, roads and bridges, public safety, and without it, and government programs through the city and the county, without it, the entire tax burden shifts to all of us in this room. And so it is really important, and I believe Minnesota will lead the way, and it should lead the way, because if anybody's gonna do it, it should happen in our backyard when we have the best the absolute highest environmental standards that you could have. It's not happening in China, guarantee you. So if we're gonna go the route we're going, we need the critical minerals, and why would we wanna be dependent on another country? If they shut off the supply, what are we going to do when we're dismantling our entire energy grid? And we can't have solar, and we can't have the wind going, because we can't run it, and our grid has been dismantled. What will we do to protect ourselves to heat, heat our homes when it's 20 below in February? Because not everybody's going to be able to have the solar panels put in place. And so I believe Minnesota mining should lead the way because we have the environmental standards. And this either or is a ridiculous conversation. We should have both clean water, clean air, and mining. Thank you. Mark, I'll give that to you. Minnesota is said to be one of the best places prepared to mine in an environmentally sound manner. And we've witnessed a number of proposals to roll back standards on sulfate, wild rice protection, water quality standards, wetland protection, and continuing efforts to reduce the rigor of permitting and curtail citizens' options to appeal mining permits in our court system. How do you see choices we face in protecting the environment while creating economic benefits, specifically through sulfide or copper nickel mine development. So this might surprise some folks, uh, since I have the last name of Munger, um, but I am not a prove it first guy, which is um, some other DFLers have decided that that's the banner they want to hang by themselves. I've taken a long, hard look at environmental uh, issues, copper nickel mining. I taught environmental law at UWS for five years. Uh, and that was one of the topics that we, we actually had the students look at and go research and think about um, the debate between jobs and um, environment. And I agree with the representative. I think we can do both, but there are parameters to that. Um, I've looked long and hard at what is now called New Range. It used to be Polymet. They've changed their name. And now they're talking about changing the way they uh, store their uh, waste from the mine. And that mine is much different than the mine down uh, by Tamarack. They're going to be shipping their ore to be processed in North Dakota. That's how they're going to process their, mi their mined ore. Uh, they're not going to do it here in Minnesota. I don't think we have to go there. I think we can do it safely. I think we do have the environmental protections in place, and part of that is the court system. Sometimes things happen that individuals need to bring matters to the courts, and they have to litigate, you know, is this going to be safe? Is this the right approach, et cetera? Um, and so, I'm willing to take a look at those issues. I'm willing to support um, reasonable copper nickel mining so long as it's done environmentally correctly and without a danger to our waters. I mean, we are the land of 10,000 lakes, okay? And I live on the Cloquet River, which is a wild and scenic river and pure, and it's a great place to live. I don't want that diminished by some mine that's owned by a Chilean. I'm sorry, I just don't. 
Thank you, Mark. The next question will be for Mark first, and this is about Indigenous rights. I'm curious what your thoughts are about uh, Minnesota being, uh, in, in this district in particular, be having a lot of Native American people and influenced by Native tribes. When you're in St. Paul, if you go there, how would you work with Native American representatives for Indigenous rights? Indigenous tribes are sovereign nations. They sign treaties with the United States of America that sometimes we were bound by and sometimes we weren't. But I've worked with Indigenous people in the courts throughout my entire career, particularly as a judge, um, both as part of the system in other words, social workers with uh, Indian legal assistance attorneys, with Fond du Lac members, with uh, 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 Grand Portage members, with Boys Fort members. Uh, I think that the indigenous rights are ingrained in a contract that we have with those sovereign nations and we have to abide by our agreement with those people. And they are part of the fabric of America. They were here before there was an America. So um, I am fully supportive of indigenous rights. Thank you, Mark. Na <laughs> Natalie, same question. If you are elected for District 3B to represent us in St. Paul, how would you work with Native American representatives and on indigenous rights? You know, the first, in my first term, we had a day for tribal nations, and one of the most profound things that one of the tribal leaders said is, we are all people of color, and white's a color, and brown's a color, and yellow's a color, and we're working together to make a better Minnesota. I 100% I voted with uh, the Democrats and supported the ICWA, which was to make sure that Native Americans and their circle of family, if a, chi if a parent can't take care of their child for whatever reason it is, that they don't go into the foster system outside of their family. I supported that law that passed, and I was proud to support that because it's the right thing to do. Did the same thing for the African American families this year, supported that in a bipartisan way, and I would do it again tomorrow because it's right. It was what I would want done for my own children. If I couldn't care for my children, I would want that to stay within our family, my parents, in-laws, you know, aunts, uncles, cousins, and in, in the circle. And then after that, go to outside people for care. And so we got that done, and I'm very proud of that. I've attended Native uh, American uh, days at the Hill and, and spent a lot of time with them in, in learning, and that's what I think it's all about, is understanding the cultures and learning from each other, and I'm glad that we got some good things done. Thank you, Natalie. <clears throat> Believe it or not, we're at the last question, and Natalie, I'm going to have you answer first. So we're going to talk about insurance for a minute, and the hail that was threatening yesterday sure had my attention. Insurance premiums are skyrocketing, and some insurance companies are pulling out of Minnesota and other states altogether, hail being a primary insurance rate to driving problem. Damage from climate change induced weather events are driving these rising costs. What will you do to reduce carbon emissions and curb rising insurance costs? Natalie. Thank you for the question. And I think insurance costs are a lot of things. There's a lot of people that are calling me about rising car insurance costs. And I can tell you that we've had 14-year-olds that are carjacking at record numbers. And that's concerning to me because they're prosecuted as juveniles. And so there's many that believe they're being exploited by criminals that are not 14 so that they're going to avoid being ha having facing any of that. But the reality is carjackings have, it, have affected our car insurance. And so when you look at those types of things, it's important for us to understand how crime and those types of situations affect all of us when it comes to our, our car insurance. As far as property insurance, 
I think it's important. I mean, the emission things, we're doing, Minnesota's done a lot of things on the emission things. We've, we're doing everything, we've done many things with uh, making sure that we have clean air and we've supported that and we did that in this last biennium. But as far as insurance go, I mean, the hail damage that's gonna come or tornado damage and those types of things, I think that that is one of the things every state in the nation is dealing with, whether you're Florida or Texas or Oklahoma, we all have different things, whether it's flooding. So they're having parameters set up of what they're going to expect for us to have as homeowners, but there's not an easy solution for this. Uh, there's many facets that are happening for uh, liability insurance for people and being able to get it, but it's a real concern, and I suspect we're going to be back at it. There were a lot of uh, consumer ideas this last year, and I think uh, as it goes on, we're going to be finding uh, possible solutions that would help uh, control the cost. But it's a very complicated issue, and it's, it's something that we have to dig in deep, and I, I look forward to those conversations. Thanks. Thank you, Natalie. And Mark, the same question for you. With insurance risk and skyrocketing premiums, some insurance companies are even pulling out of Minnesota and other states. Damage from climate change induced weather events are driving these rising costs. What will you do to reduce carbon emissions and curb rising insurance costs? So I hear in that question, very specifically we're talking about property insurance. We're not talking about car insurance. We're talking about hazard insurance to real property, your home, your cabin, uh, your condo, whatever piece of real property you have that has a dwelling or a building or a structure on it. And so the problem for all of us is that we're in an insurance pool. So what happens in California, the wildfires in California, the floods in uh, the Midwestern states, hurricanes in Florida, the you know, what happens in Hawaii even affects all of us because we're all pooled together in the common insurance pool with respect to hazard and risk insurance. Tornadoes in, you know, Tornado Alley, Oklahoma, Texas. Every time one of those catastrophic, and there's no question that the catastrophic nature of weather-related damages is increasing. Year by year by year, it's increasing. And so, um, with respect to that, we're part of the pool Minnesota doesn't have those things. I mean, yes, occasionally we get a flood. Yes, occasionally we get a tornado. But it's the coastal areas that are having the biggest problems, including the wildfires in California, Florida hurricanes, et cetera. That is climate related. And if you deny climate change, you deny the cause of why we're paying more money. And so how do we here, how do we here in Minnesota correct that? That's a really interesting question. I think you first look at what are the what are the average premiums paid on an average home? How does that relate to our neighboring states? And how are the profits with respect to the insurance companies being accrued? In other words, is it a situation like the oil companies, which we've just seen, where they're reaping massive profits off of our gas that we're buying at the pump? And so you look at those things and you make decisions as a legislator, but it is climate driven. There's absolutely no question about it. Thank you, Mark. All right, I just wanna take a minute to thank our candidates for being here tonight. I really think it's an important, yes, thank you very much, you guys. We're gonna give you a minute to. Such a privilege to have you here speaking to voters and getting out your message. Thank you for working with the Lake County Press and KTWH Radio on that. So now we're gonna have Mark go first with a two minute closing remark, and then Natalie, go ahead, Mark. I started this discussion tonight by indicating that I'm in this for one reason. I think I can bring a level of common sense, a level of um, experience, a level of having dealt with people uh, in the courts and in my life. I was a coach for 25 years in the Hermantown Soccer Association for about a decade as a hockey coach. I've dealt with people in all walks of lives. I think that I can come to the table, and I'll give you a great example. Last year, I know that uh, Representative Zelensnikar has talked about this in the past. Last year, the DFL pushed through the liaison officer bill, right? And what happened was police, uh, entities across the state of Minnesota, some of them looked at it and said, we're not gonna have 
police liaison officers in the schools. Why? Because we think there's liability for us. It's going to basically tie the hands of our officers, et cetera. Had you had a former district court judge at that table talking about that issue, a guy who actually worked with police liaison officers as a city attorney and as a prosecutor and as a judge, I think the outcome would have been different. So that's one small example of how I think I can make a difference. We would not have had to revisit the issue this year, I don't think, had Mark Munger been in, in the Minnesota legislature. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. <laughs> Natalie, go ahead. The reality is on the liaison, if they would have listened to the people that do the job and had them at the table without making decisions for them, it would have never happened. And so that's what I did. I met with all the chiefs of police, talked to them, and found out it wasn't going to work. Even when the attorney general said it's perfect, bingo, we did it. A judge wouldn't have done it. We had attorney generals at the state, Waltz, all of them saying it's fine, except the people in our community, our chief of police, and our districts were saying it doesn't work. If you don't listen to the people and let them have a voice at the table, these things happen, regardless of party. And so that's the lesson to be learned, is get the right people there. I think Minnesota's at a crossroads. I mean, the line in the sand is there. It's up to Minnesota voters to decide what they want. Do they want to have just solar and wind, or do they want to have a diversified plan that includes everything, from natural gas to nuclear to hydro to diesel to propane, so that you can heat your home the way you want, wood stove, gas stove, or you can uh, drive what you want and you can heat your business. Or do we not want to do that? And do we want to mine it here so that we can control the precious resources to go to electric and to have solar and wind? The other thing is, do we, what do we want to do with education? Do we want to continually fund the Minnesota Department of Education when we have fraud going out rampantly, leading the way for the country in the pandemic? Over 250 in indictments happening by the day. We just grew the Minnesota Department of Education by 23% knowing that we have a federal indictment. And the report came out today. They knew about it, and they didn't do what they were supposed to do. So yes, I think we can do better. And I have not heard one Minnesota said that they want a sanctuary state, wanted a new flag, and want socialism. And so I'm going to fight hard to keep the principles and the policies that built this country. I cared for people that were 85 to 100 my entire life. And they fought with their blood, sweat, and tears to give me the freedom I have to be up here. And that's why I'm running for my future grandchildren, my children, and for me, quite frankly, too, to have it. We do Thank not you, want Natalie. people to move. Thank you both, we Mark here. and Thank Natalie, you. for being here tonight. Thank you for our audience, KTWH Radio, Jose Leon, Two Harbors Media. In addition to being live streamed on KTWH 99.5, you'll find that saved on KTWH.org and on YouTube. We'll be getting out where you can listen to that and the links you'll find in the Lake County Press Facebook page in next Friday's edition of the Lake County Press. Thank you, everyone. Good night. Thank you. Thank you.